Now, I want you to track with me because I'm about to tell you something. This happened to me at Saldanta four times. I have this whole notebook of brand new messages the Lord gave me, and I thought, well, we'll take those to Alaska and preach them. And every time I go to do something, especially in a morning service, it, something happens in the spirit, and I hear something. Now, you said something a moment ago about the prophecies over Alaska, and I heard something. And I'm, I do not play games with this thing of hearing something. I know the voice of the Holy Spirit. I've been doing this 46 years. And he wants me to go in this direction. I have no idea where I'm going or how this is going to end up. But I do know I'm supposed to preach on demon kings. Demon kings. And what is a demon king? And guys, if you're taping it, I want you to go ahead and start right now. Demon, demon kings. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in heavenly places. Dr. French Arrington is a Greek scholar, and I asked him one day, I said, Dr. Arrington, is it true that often in the Greek, when a list is given, the most important thing is listed first? He said, many times that is true. He said, in Ephesians 6, verse 12, the principality is the highest ranking spirit in the kingdom of Satan. It is a demon spirit with such authority that it will control governments, nations, and cities. It is a spirit that has to be dealt with mostly by angels. Now listen to what I'm saying. If you go to Daniel 10, there was a prince of Grecia, that's a principality, a prince of Persia, that's a principality. But how was it dealt with? Did you notice that Daniel never rebuked those spirits? He never prayed against those spirits because he didn't know what he was fighting until the angel showed up. But what did God do? God sent uh, Gabriel with the message. He was restrained 21 days. Then he sent Michael the archangel. Let me just tell you, Satan is dumb to mess with Michael the archangel. Because everywhere in the Bible, he whips him. Okay, In Daniel 12 and 1, he will stand up during the tribulation period. In the book of Revelation 12, Michael the archangel will cast Satan and all of his spirits out of the second heaven to the earth. In the book of Jude, Michael the archangel wrestled for the body of Moses and rebuked Satan in the name of the Lord. So Michael is the angel that deals specifically with Satan. That's his assignment. You deal with something Satan does. You deal with something of satanic power. When the rapture happens, it says we will have a shout and the voice of the archangel. And the only archangel mentioned as an archangel in the Bible is Michael. So Michael will be involved in the rapture. And I'd like to tell you why I believe the involvement of, is important. If you are in a spirit body, spirits can wrestle spirits. That's in Daniel chapter 10 where the prince spirits wrestled the angel of God. Human people can wrestle people. But did you know that Jacob wrestled an angel? A human took on and wrestled an angel. Probably because that angel was in some form of a, of a physical body. But he wrestled him till the breaking of day. It hit me one day that when Jesus comes back in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, it says that we are caught up to meet him in the air. The Greek word caught up is harpazo. And if you want to spell it, spell it phonetically the way you hear it, harpazo. And that word means to snatch out suddenly, to snatch out by force, and to snatch out of danger's way. That's the meaning of the Greek word. But see, why would the Lord come so fast that in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the sound of the last trump, why would he come so fast that his lightning shines unto the east and shines unto the west, so shall the coming of the sun man? Twinkling of an eye, like lightning, why does he come fast? Because he has got to remove, now watch this, Ephesians 2 and 2, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. The air is dominated by these spirits. We are going to be on earth. We will be living change from mortal to immortality which means we have a spirit body if we have a spirit body we can see the spirits we can see the angels we will see god we will see all, come on we'll, ha we'll be able to look into the invisible for the first time with a resurrected body <clears throat> as we are going up i personally believe that just like in daniel 10 those spirits tried to stop the angel of god for 21 days in the atmosphere satan would attempt to stop the saints from going up he would put a blockade up there or something but the harpazo effect is that Jesus returns so fast in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you're changed. You're caught up immediately into heaven. John was on earth on the Isle of Patmos and he said, I oh, was in the spirit on the Lord's day and turned, bam, he's in heaven that quick. Why would God send Michael the archangel with the, the, the shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God to ensure 
that there is no satanic hindrance when we're headed up. That's my theory. That's my theory, and I'll stick with it. Because there's a reason this happens that quick. There's, there's more than just the reason of the spiritual and the natural. Now, having said that, <clears throat> let's talk about principalities or king demons for just a minute. A principality, in the, in the New Testament, the word principality can be used speaking of a government. I have a Greek, I don't, I don't necessarily, yeah, I do understand a little Greek, but I am not a scholar by any means. And I really enjoy Hebrew more than Greek. But when I look at that word, and I have a... Greek New Testament, it translates it into English as we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against governments. And I thought, whoa. And I started looking at everywhere the word principality is used. It's like the word arche or arche. It's one of those words. And it means the arch of a doorway that holds everything up. That's what the word, arch, arch, root word, arch. Uh, it's, the, it's the entrance into something. It is the main thing of something. So the idea is it is a main spirit. It is a chief spirit. It's a spirit that has the power to hold up that side of its kingdom that it's working with. You get the idea. So this spirit is a spirit that works in world leaders. I'll give you an example. There is no doubt in my mind that when Hitler, according to his own confession... Went to Vienna, went to Austria, and he saw that spear that allegedly was the spear of the centurion that pierced the side of Jesus that had been in the Holy Roman Empire for hundreds and hundreds of years. He read the history of it, and everybody that had this spear, it's a spear. You can see pictures of it on the Internet called the Spear of Destiny by some. Everybody that had this spear ruled the world. Every leader that ever had it in its possession, if they lo one, one leader lost it in the river and lost his empire that afternoon. Everybody that owned the spear, once they lost it, you, lose, you lost power. And Hitler was staring at a glass showcase at the spear and describes a spirit that he sees. Now, he's on peyote, a mind-expanding drug, but he sees a spirit, quote, sublime and fearful that is behind this showcase, and he gave his soul to the spirit of the beast. Yeah, he became possessed by that demon. And they, at the time, he wasn't Hitler the dictator. He was Hitler the art student. He, he wasn't even into politics, but he gave his soul to this, this spirit. And so it, it's interesting that the United States bombed the bunker that that spear was in, and we found it. And one of our generals was pretty much into occultism, and he said, bring it to the United States. And when we, when, when we were in control of it, guess what happened? We became a nuclear power, and we bombed Japan. Then we gave the spear back to the Hasberg family over in uh, Austria, somewhere in Germany, and now it's back on display in a museum. Spear of destiny. So these spirits are attached to things. But more than that, they try to attach themselves to world leaders. I believe Saddam Hussein was under a prince spirit. I believe that uh, Mussolini was under a prince spirit in Italy. If you look at the history of what they did, I believe, for example, that bin Laden had some kind of it. How, do, how does a man live in a cave, take an empire down? Talk to me, somebody. He's in a cave with a turban on his head, you know, <laughs> hiding riding a camel, and he says to America, we'll take you down. How do you plan it and we not find out about it? And then how do you fight for years? We have the best intelligence in the world. How do you fight for years and not even know where the guy is? It doesn't make sense unless you understand there's some kind of a spirit that is helping him. Saddam Hussein asked for spirits to help him. Can I tell you, he was discovered by a dream that a preacher had. A preacher I know had a dream, said he's hiding in a hole near his hometown because I saw him as a little boy jumping in a hole, and our troops found him. He had contacts in the White House. And they said, well, go down there and look at his hometown. They got to searching down there and found Saddam Hussein hiding in a hole. Looked like his demon gave up on him. And the devil will do that to you. He'll take you out there, make you think it's great, hang you up, and leave you all by yourself. Don't you think he won't do it? All right, back to principality spirits. Everybody ready? Now, my question was this. What are they? I believe they are a group of fallen angels. I believe that, in my opinion, I believe that for, just from my study of Scripture, because of their ranking and because of their authority and because of their power, they were probably some of God's highest ranking angels, Satan. I'm of the opinion, again, now look, I can prove it from the Bible, but I, I, I would be here all day. 
I believe that the reason that Lucifer was so different, or Satan, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, same person, was because he was probably the very first angel that God ever created. He was perfect, according to the Bible. He was an anointed cherub, according to the Bible. Every stone, he had these beautiful gemstones on him, was his covering. He was lifted up because of pride. He was lifted up because of his beauty. He led a rebellion against God. And according to Revelation chapter 12, he drew one third of the angels of God with him when he fell. Out of that one third, a group of those produced a race of giants on the earth. Those angels are now bound in chains of darkness, 2 Peter 2 and 4, and also the book of Jude. So they are bound. You don't worry about them. But there is another group of very high-ranking angels that I believe became the principalities who were probably angels in the beginning that Satan was directly connected to, even in the worship of God. There's, there's warring angels, there's worshiping angels, and there's working angels. Working angels are ministering spirits constantly going forth to minister. Warring angels are Michael and his angels angels. Revelation 12 said Michael and his angels fought. Michael has a group of warring angels. But then there are worshiping angels. I, I'll let you hey, look at mm, Gabriel is, is the head of the revelation. Michael is the head of the warfare. Guess who used to be the head of the worship? The Bible says your pipes were created in you. Your tablets were created in you. Your vials were created. See, Satan, Lucifer, in the beginning, used to be able to open his mouth and sound would come out. He was a, Phil Driscoll said he was a walking musical instrument. Phil Driscoll took those verses about Lucifer and noticed that he's, now he's a musician, greatest trumpet player on the planet. He said, I noticed that Satan was created he, with the percussion. He was, and he started going through the instruments, the, the way you divide instruments up in a musical study or in a college. He said, the one trumpet, you gonna, uh, one, the one thing Satan never gave the devil in the Old Testament was the trumpet. He had tabrets, that's tambourines, that's percussion. He had vials, he had pipes, like the woodwinds, but listen... The one instrument that God never created in him was the trumpet. God saved that one for himself. The shofar is God's. But in case you didn't... Oh, let me go ahead and preach right here. <laughs> in case you didn't know it, every, a, if you ever saw a shofar, it's got a mouth here, right? And it twists around. It comes down. And there's a little hole there at the bottom, right? And you blow into that, and the air comes out at the top of the mouth. You have a shofar. Open up your mouth. You've got a windpipe that goes all the way down to your belly. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of your spirit comes the praise. So you got a built-in trumpet. So God gave you something he never gave the devil. He gave you a trumpet to shout and worship and praise him. Hey, a built-in trumpet. Any time of the day, any time of the night, any moment of the day, you can say, hey, hallelujah. Hey, come on now. Wow. Now we're going to get sidetracked, obviously, from time to time. <laughs> so let's go back to this idea. So here's what happens. I'm going to show you an example in the Bible. How many know the story? We won't have to turn there and read it if everybody knows the story. How many of the story of Cain killing his brother Abel? Why did he kill him? And this is really weird, but it's true. He killed him over an offering. Have you ever thought about that? Both of them brought an offering. One brought the fruit of the ground, right? One brings a lamb, a blood. One, well, let's say it this way. One brought fruit from the earth and one brought blood. God was pleased with the blood because God had already sacrificed two animals to cover Adam and Eve. There would be sacrifices all through the Old Testament. So God was into the blood offering. Cain was jealous. Cain killed his brother, right? So in other words, the first murder in the Bible is over religion. People are still fighting over religion. The Hindus are fighting the Muslims. Muslims are fighting Christians. Muslims, Jews and Muslims many times are fighting. And Christians fight each other. Mabel, are you still there? Did you hang up the phone? They fight each other over crazy stuff, over doctrine, over what's my favorite church, who's my favorite pastor, I like him, I don't like you because you like him, blah, blah, blah. Now, in the Bible, and I don't want to take the time to do this because I don't want to take any time unnecessary, but when Cain killed Abel, you remember God said, where's your brother? And he said, Who am, I? am I my brother's keeper? And then when God told him that he knew what he did, Cain said, well, if they that find me shall kill me. What did God do? Put a mark on Cain, right? 
And uh, most people believe, and I do too, and I don't have time to develop this, that it was the letter Tav, which would be, end up becoming the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is the symbol of a cross. That God marked him in his head with the cross to protect him. And that's why the cross became a symbol all through the Old Testament even of a mark of protection. It goes back to Cain. That's just an idea that some have had in rabbinical sources. Cain then, here's what happens to Cain. Somebody say this. Here, say neighbor. neighbor. Here's what happens to Cain. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Eden was, uh, now I preach this, and I'm not going to go over this, but I preached this at uh, uh, Sherry's church. So on Eden was a 1,500, uh, I'm sorry, 1,500 mile square foot guard. Did I not prove that, Pastor? Yeah. By the rivers of Eden, which is the Gihon, the Nile, and the Euphrates, and the Tigris, and the Pishon. Mention the book of Genesis. If you look at those rivers and match them out, where the headwaters begin, where it ends, it's 1,500 miles and Jerusalem becomes the center of the Garden of Eden. Amazing. Where the tree of life was. Was it pretty cool? I mean, seriously, that is one of the coolest messages you'll ever hear in your life. Too bad can't preach it here, don't have the time. Okay, here we go. Now, because honestly, we'd be here... All day and all night if we got into that subject. So, I want you, yeah, she says that's the truth. <laughs> so watch this because this gets very interesting. Cain leaves. Now remember, Eden has rivers. So to go outside of Eden, what do you have to do? Watch my hand. Here's a boundary. You're living here. Now if you're going to go past the boundary, what do you do? You cross over the boundary. Now the eastern part of the Garden of Eden was the Hiddekel or the Tigris River and the Euphrates in Genesis chapter 2. If you look at the landmass, what is east of there, it is basically, you have, now it depends on the border, but you have, you have the area, you have the, the, those rivers come down through Syria, they come down through Iraq, but the real country that's east of there is Iran. Now, Iran is interesting because the old name in the Bible is Persia. Now, there was a good king named Cyrus that came out of Persia. There were some good things that came out of Persia. Don't get me wrong. But did you know in history, there was a group called the Hashashim? And the Hashashim were men. They were from the area that we today call Persia or Iran. They were Persians. And so the leader would get them high on hashish and say, now when you kill that person, this is what it's going to feel like. And then he started teaching them that there was a special place for them and wine and women if they would go assassinate. They, hashashim became assassin. That's where we get the name assassin from, from uh, the etymology of the word can be traced back to that part of the world. Now here's what's interesting. I know a lot of Persians. Pam and I have some great friends. As a matter of fact, can I blow your mind? And I guess I can say this on the, well, maybe I better not. But anyway, uh, one, of the, one of the great churches, uh, church movements, and the news has brought this out, is the church in Iran. And uh, Iran and Persia has a move of God. And I had a pastor tell me, he said, we have used your material for 15, 14 years. I said, wow. He said, no, you don't understand. We've used it and people have been won. And I asked him how many converts I had. He said 400,000. I couldn't believe it. I've never been there. But he said, honestly, Perry, you've influenced that many people one way or the other toward the Lord. All, all young people. Now, I'm not going to say any more than that than to tell you this. If you look, however, at the leadership, the 20%, 80% are pretty, you know, just good people. They want freedom because they were under the Shah when they had freedom. And then the, the uh, Islamic radicals came in. But if you look very carefully, this is interesting, at what you see there, you see terrorism. You see terrorism against Israel. You see them paying for terrorism against Israel. You saw, you saw where they held us hostage for 444 days under Jimmy Carter. If you just look at the spirit, not the people, not, not, don't look at the people, but if you look at the spirit that has operated in that part of the world, the spirit being the principality, what will you see? Murder, religious murder. Oh, you didn't hear me. Cain killed his brother over religion. Cain goes the east of Eden, and the east of Eden past the Euphrates and Tigris is Iran and Persia. Land of Nod. Hebrew means wandering. He just wandered around. But the spirit that Cain carried in his heart as he had children, it's passed down. Can I prove it's passed down? Yes. Cain killed one man, Abel. Lamech, who was a descendant of Cain, he killed two men. And he said, if Cain's punishment is seven times, my punishment will be 70, well, seven times, uh, it'll be 70 in other words. All that's in the book of Genesis. So from 
Cain's lineage comes what? Murder. From Cain's lineage becomes the ability of hating each other and rising up in anger and tempers flaring and killing. And so that whole part of the world, even, even, what, they, even what the Turks did to the Armenians, uh, killing over a million of them many years ago. And if you look at the murder that's been in the Middle East, it all comes from that territory. Are you listening, somebody? So now, again, it's a spirit. So that spirit over that part of the world is one that deals with religion, arguing over religion, debating over religion, killing someone that disagrees with you. And you can see that even in modern times. Now, another thing that's interesting is the area of Iraq, not, uh, not Iran. Iran is Shia, uh, uh, Shia Muslim. Iraq is Sunni Muslims. Iraq is where Saddam Hussein was from. Now, Iraq basically has been a friend to the United States off and on for many years. But also, but when they get a leader that's corrupt, you see the same thing happening. They kill the innocent people, they, they rape the girls. It's just absolutely horrible what happens in some of that. They, and ISIS tried to take over that area, you know that story. They took over Syria. Thousands, list, list, hundreds of thousands of people dead in Syria. Many of them were Syrian Christians that had to flee. It was just awful. That whole part of the world is a powder keg. Now, why is it that if you look, let's, let's just talk about the past 25 years. If you look at the past 25 years, where has most of the terrorism originated? Afghanistan, right? Of course, bin Laden hid in Pakistan. But Afghanistan and, and Iraq or Persia and Iran and Syria, all of your terrorists that attack Israel or even attack the United States have come from that Gulf area, that part of the world. So there's something going on is what I'm trying to tell you in that part of the world. There are a lot of moms and dads and children and people that would be considered good people in our eyes, good moral people or the people that, that have, a, have a faith of some kind. But there are so many that seem to go on the edge of the opposite. And if they go in with the radical side, it's an entire change of situation. Now, let's go back again. Now, we went to uh, Genesis 4, how Cain goes east of Eden. Now let's jump from Genesis 4 to after the flood. After the flood, and we're talking about these spirits, how they take root. We're going to come to Alaska in a minute. All right, come on. All right. But how do these spirits take root? If you go back to, for example, the book of Genesis, the, the, the Ark of Noah was on Mount Ararat, which is located in Turkey. And by the way, there's some people that have, this video is on the internet, and I think it's totally legit, where the guy finally went inside, and the wood, you can see how the wood is chipped, you can see all the things in it, and how ice has collapsed. It's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty cool thing. I think it may be accurate from people that have told me. Could be, could be, but nonetheless. So the Ark is there. Now, according to Jewish historians, including Josephus and others, men were afraid to get off the mountains and go back into the valley. You know what they were afraid of? Another flood coming. But yet God said, I'll not destroy the earth with flood again. I'll put the rainbow in the sky as proof of it, right? So if men would have paid attention to what God said to Noah, they wouldn't have been afraid to go back to the valley. We still have little floods, we know, but the earth's not going to be destroyed again. There was a man by the name of Nimrod in the book of Genesis that started building cities in the plains of Shinar. The plains of Shinar is the valley that runs along the Euphrates and the Tigris River at the border of Iraq and Iran. It runs through Syria, etc. So that's that plain, especially in the country of Iraq where Saddam Hussein once ruled. Now, one of the cities he built was called Babel, and he built a tower to reach the heavens, right? So I did some research on this idea. You can't, you can't build a tower to reach the heavens because the heavens is too far. Why is he building a ziggurat that goes up in a big base and it keeps going up to the top? Well, some say he, had a, he was worshiping the sun, moon, and stars, but it goes deeper than that. The Jewish historians say that Nimrod was angry at God for destroying the ancestors by the flood. He also says that when the, when the flood waters came off the mountains and into the valleys, that all of the bones of the people settled in the plains of Shinar. You'd find bones all over the place. They were angry. So he wanted to build a tower to defy God, and he built something that if a flood ever came, he could get to the top of it and look at God and shake his fist and said, couldn't kill me, could you? What he didn't know is God didn't have to send a flood. God struck it down with the wind and destroyed the whole thing. Men used to be one language, and at the Tower of Babel, 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 Babel you know, we talk about, oh, they just babble on and on, Babel. Just talk, 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 talk. He confounded their languages and divided the nations among the languages at the Tower. You know that story from Genesis 11. But let's go a step further, because I want you to understand where I'm coming from with this idea of king spirits. Now, let's go back to Nimrod. Did you know that we did a study, I did a study on Bab Babel, Babel, 
Babuel. And I went to the Semitic word, right? Now, I thought it meant confusion because Babel means confusion. Even the Bible, it says that God confused. So that's why they say the Tower of Babel was a place of confusion. Did you know what it can mean in the ancient language? Gate of the God. Babel, where the tower was built, was the gate of the God. So then I started saying to myself, no, wait a minute. Gate of what God? Okay. Uh, I think it's Marduk was the... One of the gods of Babylon back in Daniel's day. There's all these different gods everybody's got, but what god? Then I started realizing something. Are you all still here? You see Babylon in Genesis 11. You see Babylon in the book of Daniel. And in the book of Revelation, you see mystery Babylon. How come this place keeps showing up? Why all the way to the end of time do you see that name? All the way in the last days at the very end of time, there in the wilderness, there is mystery Babylon the great that rules over the king. Why does the name keep, keep being used? Then I went back to the beginning of time and realized that those rivers in that area were the eastern edge of the Garden of Eden. I realized that civilization began in the cradle of civilization, which is those two rivers all the way up into Lebanon, all the way into Israel, all the way into Egypt, all the way into the Nile. That's where it all began. It did not begin in the U.S. It did not begin in Canada. It did not begin in Europe. It began in that part of the world with the creation of Adam, with the Garden of Eden. That's where everything began. Now, why is that important to understand? Because when Satan fell from heaven, he did not fall and set up his headquarters in North America 6,000 years ago. You know why? There are no humans. Listen to what I'm about to say. Principalities work through personalities. A principality without a person is limited. A spirit, a spirit, a, an invisible spirit without a human body is limited to what it can do. That's why demons want to possess people. They can only act out what they want when they have a human. Watch out now. Okay, let's just take it this way. How come Satan didn't come in the garden as Satan? He's an, he's an angel. He's an anointed cherub. He has, he has features of a person, but he's still angelic. Why didn't he stand at that tree as Satan and said, Hey, baby, what's up? To Eve, you know? Come over here and try this for... You know why? There's only two people in that garden. Now, they, Adam and Eve, according to Josephus, did have children in the garden that later went out and lived. And that's who Cain married was somebody in the family. But watch this. In... Basically, there's nobody there in the center of the garden but them walking with God and hearing God walk in the cool of the day. So if Satan shows up as a six foot nine being, let's say he has wings. I'm just assuming this here. Let's just, let's just tell a story. And he's this beautiful creature. Eve is going to know something ain't right. See, here's the thing about Satan and the kingdom of darkness. They never show up as demons. They show up as a pretty girl. Look, I got quiet when I said that. They show up as a handsome man. Right? Are, you, are you with me, somebody? They show, up, they show up as someone who's actually a seducer, someone who's a deceiver, someone that's a trickster. So in other words, Satan don't show up as Satan. If he showed up as the devil, you're going to say, get out, of my, get out of my face, devil. You, you know, I've, I've often said if the snake had not been a male because it, it was he, the snake, the snake and him and he, it wasn't a female. If the snake had been a female, there would have never been a fall because Eve would have said, you sorry, huzzy, I know who you're after. You're after my husband. Get out of that tree. Get out of this garden. You ain't going to have my man. I know you little sorry thing, you little Jezebel. You're a deceit. Because this woman right here says, ain't no woman that knows a woman like another woman. They see right through them. Where's my women in the house that know what a woman is like? Come on. My women, I better watch saying that. Somebody, he said he had women in Alaska. So here's the thing. <laughs> some nut, some nut. So here's the thing. You all know what I'm saying here, that if it had been a certain, set up a certain way, no, no fall would have took place. So what Satan, though, can't come as Satan. So what does he do? He uses a creature they are familiar with. Let me say it again. The serpent was more crafty than any creature of the field which the Lord has made. Josephus even said that the serpent could one time talk. You say, animals can't talk. I got a parakeet that can say a hundred words. Don't tell me they can't talk. And he'll wake you up in the middle of the night. But roll tide, roll tide. Pay me poop, pay me poop, pay me poop, pay me poop. Pay me poop. Pay me poop. That's what her nickname is. So... Uh, it, it used to communicate, and then when, when man fell, God put poison in the snake's mouth and, mouth and took the ability of it to communicate and then cursed it on its belly. You know, did you know a snake used to walk? 
There's pictures, there are uh, hieroglyphics in tombs in, in ancient Samaria of serpents. They are a snake. They are not a lizard. They don't have front, they're not on all four. Their, their tail is balancing them, and they've got two hind legs and two feet, and they're walking. It says that God said to the serpent, on the ground you will go, and on your belly you will crawl. It didn't crawl in the beginning. It, and, and there's fossils found in Jerusalem that you have two little hooks on the back. I mean, in rock quarries, there's three that were found. It is not, they will tell you, this is a serpent. This is a snake that one time had legs. This, you know, it's, this is in Ramallah, which is near Jerusalem. Come on, somebody, think about that. So you know what, you know what God, Jesus did? You know what God did when he took the legs off of it? He defeated the devil. Come on, in the very beginning. Hey, 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 Lord. He defeated him. <laughs> All right, let's get back on this. So, so, so if we look at, you know, at Babel, that area, this is what, and again, I'm getting, um, yeah, let me say it this way. When Jacob had a dream, there was a ladder. Remember the dream of the ladder. The bottom was earth. The top was the gate of heaven and angels coming up and coming down. That's called a portal. That was the city of Jerusalem. That was the temple mount where that dream happened. So he sees the future of how there's something going to be there. And angels are going to bring tithe up and offerings up. And they're going to bring the blessings down. And Jacob said, this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And they built the temple right where the ladder was. You didn't see that ladder. It was invisible. But it was still there in the spirit, right? Now, likewise, Babel is the gate of the God. Let me tell you, all the trouble in history up until the time of the Roman Empire came out of ancient Babel and ancient Babylon. The Babylonians destroyed the temple and took the Jewish people captive and took their treasures. Then after the Babylonians came the Medes and Persians. And guess, they didn't, they didn't rule from Media Persia. They ruled from Babylon. And after the Medes and Persians, 200 years came the Greeks. Alexander the Great died in Babylon. I mean, I can tell you the history of that part of the world is so weird because three of the major... Three of the four major empires of Bible prophecy ruled from there. And the history of that area is really, really bizarre. And I can show you things that they found in muse they have in museums and pictures. I can show you what looks like cherubim. I can show you descriptions of biblical angels and, uh, and giants. I have a, I have, Pam knows I've got this. I have one of these things going in my Holy Land Museum. And it has a picture of a giant man that is four times bigger than any person standing in front of him. It's on a clay tablet It's 30-some hundred years old. Giants existed. Let me tell you why Babylon is the... Is, it is a headquarters. Jerusalem is the headquarters of God. God put his name there three times in the book of Deuteronomy. God put his sacred temples there. Jesus is crucified there. The church was born there. Jerusalem is the city of God. But Babel and the area of Babylon is the headquarters of Satan because when he fell from heaven, that's where he set up his headquarters. Because that's why he moves Cain. He motivates Cain to cross the river because he's got to start a civilization and he's got to start a people that he can try to use in that part of the world to counter and destroy the people God's going to bring in. You tracking with me? All right. Now, I could tell you this, that... The archangel Michael is the prince of Israel in Daniel 12 and 1. Every time Israel goes to war and wins this really weird war, you can guarantee that Michael was involved with the victory. And Michael is to this day the guardian angel of the nation of Israel. Once again, how do you know that? Because God says to Daniel, Michael, your prince. Michael, your prince. Now, <clears throat> this brings me to my thought that the Holy Spirit gave me earlier, and I'm going to develop this a little bit more and then we're going to tell you the nugget that I feel like the Holy Spirit <laughs> oh, Holy Spirit put in my spirit for you that are here and for those that may not even be here this will be received um, whew, give me a second because I want to make sure that I'm not leaving something out king spirits or prince spirits have to have a population to work through then they have to have a one head leader that rules that population. You have to have a Nimrod ruling the tower. You have to have a Saddam Hussein ruling Iraq. You have to have a Hitler ruling Germany. So if they can find a, a very strong personality that is not from God, that is not right. Someone said, well, you know, why does the Lord allow 
these kind of people to even come to power. Okay, go to the temptation of Jesus, Matthew 4, Luke 4, and read what Satan says to Jesus. He tempts him with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. He tempts him with three things after 40 days of fasting. And Satan says to Jesus, hey, bow and worship me and I will give you the kingdoms of the world. Now, here's the next day, next verse. For they have been delivered unto me and I give them to whomsoever I will. Now, you say that doesn't happen. Really? Then, why? then it wouldn't have been a temptation. Because the devil can't tempt you with something that don't mean nothing to you. He can't tempt you with something that doesn't put pressure on you to do it. Hello. it ain't a, it's not a temptation if it doesn't have pressure. How many people know what I'm talking about? Get your halos, get your halos off your head and let's talk about it. Huh? So Satan is basically saying this to, to Jesus. If you will honor me, just, just give into what I want you to do. Give into what I want you to do. I'll make you the head of Rome. I'll make you the Roman emperor. I'll give you the... I'll give you the now, now why, do I, why did he say kingdoms of the world? Because Rome occupied the world. Own, Rome had this country, this country, this country, that country. They were occupying the world. So he says, I'll put you on the Roman throne. All you got to do is, just, man, just do what I tell you. You're going to love this. How do you try to convince a king who owns the world to be a king over just an empire? Watch out, you didn't hear what I... I hear Jesus being called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He owns the whole thing. He could look at the devil and say, so you want to give me the Roman Empire? What you talking about? I own the whole thing already. I was with my father when it was all my... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. Jesus, have mercy. <laughs> right? So it's interesting. Let's use this for an example. That in the early church from the time of Nero to the time of Emperor Constantine in the 4th century, that there were 10 persecutions against Christians. One guy would come along and just arrest them. You worship me. You, you say that we're the only king or else. And they'd arrest him. They'd beat him. They'd torture him. They'd persecute him. It was, all, it was terrible to be a Christian for the first three and a half centuries. It really was. It, you, didn't know, you didn't know sometimes with some emperors if you're going to live or die. All right? Constantine comes to power, and Constantine somehow has a vision. He sees a cross in the sky, the Cairo, which is the emblem of Christ. By this conqueror, he goes to battle. They even put some of them on their shields. He wins this really weird battle he's not supposed to win. He becomes the emperor of the Roman Empire. He legalizes Christianity, and all of a sudden, you get this shifting in that part of the world. Now watch. When a leader who liked Christianity came to power, can I tell you why in America that we are having the trouble we're having. Let me just get political for a minute. Who in the name of Perry Stone, John Henry, and everybody else hires 87,000 IRS agents and then makes a statement, we want them armed? What's, what's happening here? If you want papers from a former president, you walk in kindly and say, would you meet us down there? We're going to go through there. We have to have this. We have a, you don't do this raid, stand out with machine guns like you own the place. Come on, talk to me, somebody. And yet somebody else puts a server in her closet and has three classified emails. One classified email gives you a charge of treason. And there are men in prison that had one email. I know someone that worked for the government. And I said, what happens if you have one email that's, that's classified on a separate server? She said, you get walked out that day and sent straight to prison. They warn you about it. But all oh, some people just never go to jail. Okay, I'm going to stay off of that because I can tell by looking at some of you, you don't like what I'm saying. <laughs> You better watch out. Watch out, that, watch out that Prince Spirit will rest on your head. You better be careful now what I'm talking about. He'll come down right on top of you. So, so these, these spirits, here's what I want to go to. Uh, how did they get in America? How did, they, how, did they get, how did they settle here? Now, first of all, I'm going to bring this out in a minute. The U.S. started, started from the East Coast. I mean, I'm in history. 13 colonies on the East Coast. Then it slowly made its way to the Midwest, and it slowly made its way with Lewis and Clark to the West, and slowly, okay. So let, so let me give you something that I think you're going to find very interesting. You still here? Yeah. I want to take you to a place called Sutter's Mill. And some of you know what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. Sutter's Mill was a place where somebody was looked in a creek and found something really goldish looking, shining, and held it, reached down and found it. 
and took it into town and said, Dear Lord, you just found gold. Where'd you find it at? Well, Sutter's Mill up here. It was a mill. And uh, all of a sudden, word got out, and they started taking these uh, big panning for gold, and it was 1849. And that's why the San Francisco 49ers have the name they do. Because Sutter's Mill is near San Francisco. All right, now we know without going into detail, because I'm on television there, and there's, there are some good churches in that area, but I mean, really, there really are some, some Modesto and places like that. So I don't want to sound like this is something attack or negative, but I want to bring a point out. Uh, if you look at the state seal of California, or the state seal of the state, it's really interesting because it is a picture of Minerva, who is a Greek goddess, in a male Roman soldier's outfit overlooking the San Francisco Bay. She's supposed to be the goddess of wisdom and prosperity and commerce. Okay, that's why they chose her. But let me talk to you about this because I saw a program on one night and I'm not going to name the place. It was one of the major networks. And what they were doing was they were doing the history of Sutter's Mill. In the beginning, the, tr the trek from anywhere in America to get there was so rough some men did not take their wives or their daughters. They left them at home and went in wagons and horses and what they could. And they went there. Basically, it was, it was in the beginning before they developed communities. It was all men. They show on this channel their entertainment on the weekend. This men, the men's entertainment was getting drunk, dressing a man like a woman, and doing you know what. Isn't that crazy? So in other words, you know, these guys are alone and it's not a big deal. So they really dress this guy up. And now this is a secular, this is not a Christian place telling you this. And I said, oh my goodness. Now listen, could it be that the spirit that rules the strongest got in with that type of thing early? Because it created a weakness. It created an open door. See, when God spoke to Cain, Cain said this, or God said, where's your brother? I'm, 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 I'm my brother's keeper. And he said, God said to Cain, if you do well, if you're doing okay, you're fine. But if you're not, sin lies at the door. So what happens is, if you go to any, and I could, I could talk about uh, cities we've been to. I could talk about New York and ha what they did in New York. I could talk about states. We'd be here for a week. <laughs> We're not going to go there. We're going to give you this thought and let you meditate on it. But if you look at it, the early beginning of these communities and the early beginning of these cities, if you will trace them back and you go to the original sin. I told Pam the other day, I said, you know what I see a lot of up here? Saloons and bars. Okay. And you know why they're here? Because since years ago, when gold was discovered, and they came up here to the Klondike. It's cold, and, and the old timers didn't have everything they needed, and so they used whiskey to warm them up. And now you have bar after bar after bar after bar after bar because of the winter and the cold. So something gets in, you with me, early, and it develops and it emerges, and then it's an opportunity. Now, that doesn't mean all these people out there are possessed by demons and doing that. They just think they're opening up a business. But I'm saying that what you see that is your stronghold, if you will trace it back, you'll understand how it became a stronghold, and that's part of it. Okay. Now, Pastor said something a minute ago, and I want to get right, into, right to this part right here because I could go into all kinds of things, but I think you're... I think you're understanding what I'm saying. Number one, I'm going to try to go through what I feel like the Holy Spirit gave me. Number one, prince spirits fell with Satan in the beginning of time. And maybe I should have said this at the beginning. I probably should have. But now it's going to make more sense. So when Satan fell from heaven, Jesus said in Luke 10, I beheld Satan's lightning fall from heaven. We know that happened. We know there was a fall. We know he took angels with him. So when they fell, Satan took the strongest personalities, the strongest spirits, and there are, angels have levels of authority. Listen, Michael is over Gabriel because Gabriel couldn't fight a prince of Persia and Michael did. Okay? There are levels of authority. Demons have levels of authority. How do I know that? Because when the unclean spirit goes out, this is what Luke said, he goes and gets seven of the spirits more wicked than himself. 
and they dwell there, and the man is worse than he was in the beginning. Uh, so uh, the man of Gadara, another example. 2,000 demons went into pigs. So we assume there was, there was 2,000 spirits in the guy. And the head spirit said, my name is Legion, for we are many. There's one spirit that's the spokesman for all the others. Are you, are you still here? So in other words, angels have levels of authority. Demonic spirits have levels of authority, okay? So Satan fell from heaven, and those spirits came with him. And he introduces a specific level of authority. Second thing is this. These spirits took up their strongholds in the Middle East area where civilization began. They took up the area of Assyria or Syria, Babylon, Persia, uh, uh, Lebanon. These are, these are early nations. These nations existed as far as some of them have their original biblical names. Israel was an early, Egypt, huge, huge empire of Bible prophecy, right? Uh, and Ethiopia at one time was connected uh, next to Egypt. So if you go to history, you'll discover that civilization begins in the Middle East. It spreads after the flood, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. One goes to Africa, one goes into Asia, and one stays in the Middle East. And the whole world gets populated through those three sons. Now, those first three sons were righteous boys with a righteous wife. But it didn't take long. As a, as a matter of fact, if you want to look at Sodom and Gomorrah, how long it was from the flood, you'll discover it only took a couple hundred years for God to start re for corrupting himself again. Because it was in the human nature. The Holy Spirit had been poured out. There was no written Bible. What did people stand on? You know, so they did every, everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. So that's where it begins. So then, and this is important, I said it a moment ago, since principalities work through personalities, print demon spirits will demon spirits will go to a hunting camp. Demon spirits will go to a to to the bar. And I'm not comparing those two, by the way. Demon spirits I just was making a point. What I'm saying is they'll go they'll go to a house, an apartment, in a car. The lesser spirits deal with you individually. They attack you individually. The lesser ones, okay? The big kings, this is important, hang over high population centers. And if you don't believe it, go fly to some cities in the world. And that plane lands, and you step off the plane, and I'm going to tell you something, you feel like you are smothering. Who's been there? When communism fell, I flew to Budapest, Hungary. And I'm telling you, the oppression, it wasn't in the plane. But we landed that plane, the demon oppression was, un I'm, I told you, Jensen was with me. I said, I'm going to go home. He said, that's the weirdest thing. He said, I did too. I just feel, and it was like that the whole trip. We saw great results, but I'm telling you, there were still those oppressive spirits. I mean, when the Holy Ghost would hit in a church and the windows were open, they were, even though they were free, they would run and start closing the windows and put guards outside thinking the secret police were coming to arrest everybody. Even though that that had stopped, they were still like an animal that's out of a cage that's just walked a cage and they let it out of the cage. It'll still walk that same pace even though it's out of the cage. And I never forget how oppressive it was. And we've been to other countries where you can feel just something. Some, and then it's like, my God, I'm so glad to get out of there. Now, I love Jordan and Israel. It has changed. And Jordan is the coolest place. I mean, they've got peace treaty with Israel. But I remember going to Jordan when you got on the bus at the border. This is 1984, baby. 85, wasn't it? So we go to Jordan. We fly into Jordan Airlines. We get to the Israeli border. And the guards are coming on. And Do you have an Israeli passport? Stamp in your passport. Let me see your passport. And you felt harassed. Now, it doesn't, it's not like that now because they have a peace negotiation. And Pam will tell you, this is the God's truth. When you cross, I feel the Holy Ghost talking about it. But when you went from Jordan, which is a beautiful country, beautiful people, very friendly, very friendly people. Most of them have kids in college over here. When you cross the border at the Jordan River, did it not happen? The whole bus, ah, ah, they start crying. They start shouting. You cross a, a little river. But the atmosphere was completely different. Did you feel it too? And then when you go back to Jordan, as much as you like it, you have a different atmosphere. Now, it's not bad, but it's not the same as Israel. And then when you cross over back to it is the, I'm telling you, it is the, is it not weird? Say, tell them that. Yeah, we went back and forth over dividing lines, and it was just the difference. It was like power God 
and then hindrance. Yeah. Power of God. Yeah. And we yeah. went back and forth like this. It freaked yeah. us out. And the, and the, and the situation, yeah, the situation is you have to go back to understand Jordan is Edom and Moab. Edom and Moab were Israel's enemies for centuries. And they've only made peace recently. So there has been a contention at the Jordan River. And watch. And see, Satan has to, mm, Satan has to watch his boundaries. God, don't let him just loose all over the place. We have authority to bind and loose. We have authority to pray. We have authority to say, hold back. We have authority to call angels. So he can't just do it. So he has a boundary limit at times. Can I prove it to you? You want to hear about the boundary limit? Satan comes and says, let me take Job's stuff. He'll curse you. He took everything Job had. Satan comes back and said, let me have his health. And God said, well, you can have his health, but you can't take his life. Boundary. Boundary. You can't take it. Don't touch his life. You're not going to kill. I ain't letting you kill him. Come on, somebody. So the Lord has Satan on a leash, so to speak. He can do so much, but there's things God says you won't do that. Well, that's a good word for somebody here. That really is. Okay, let's go to Alaska. Now, I'm going to tell you my Alaska story. The first time we ever came up here was a cruise. Right? Is that Larry and Jean and, and Amanda? Right, that was the one. What stunned me was the mountains where the cruise ship, I don't even know where we were, but we go between the mountains and I said, oh my God, these mountains have never had a human walk on them. Am I telling the truth? Animals have, but some of these mountains, since God put, God, I might have think about what I'm saying. Since God created it, there have been mountains that have never been polluted by a human footprint. Am I right? You're from Alaska. Raise, raise your hands if I'm right. Some of these high mountains, cliffs, they've never tracked them. They've never searched for nothing on them. All right. That means that the land is pure. But you stay with me. The land has not been defiled. The land has not really been polluted, really. The land, I mean, you're talking about, they say, pristine Alaska. There is almost nowhere else in the U.S., because of the big cities we have on the West Coast, not too many places that can truly say our whole state's pristine, our rivers, our lakes. Now, I'm going to tell you how to read it. I'm going to show you why God would select Alaska as a place to do why God would select Alaska as a place to spearhead a final revival that spreads. I'm going to show you why. Look, my hair is standing up right now. I'm like an electricity. This state, now somebody tell me, when was Alaska officially founded? Because Russia, you know, sold it to the United States, right? Am I right? Yeah. They sold it. So the state was founded. That, that's when I was born. 1959, for real. But you had villages and towns, right? But it was founded. Okay, now think about what I'm saying. Listen to me carefully. All of the principalities in the kingdom of Satan have already set up their headquarters before you all ever came along. Do you think that a prince over Los Angeles will leave Los Angeles to come to Wasilla? Tell me why not. There are too many people in L.A. that they can take to hell. How many live in this town? How many? No, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. How many? Thousands? Somebody said, huh? People. Okay, 11. Is, is the principality going to leave Seattle to come up here to 11,000 people? Now, will spirits? Sure. Because there's lesser spirits. How many? Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, I believe it's so pristine, it's so young, it doesn't have the pull and impact of an ancient city or a city that they have control. Pr listen, familiar spirits do not like to leave the area they are familiar with. The man of Gadara is delivered, and the demon said, don't send us out of the country. Keep us here. So these spirits don't want to leave who they're familiar with. Listen, I can take you to towns in the mountains in where I'm from, where there's four and five generations of people, and there are generational demons up there. Because that same family's been fighting alcoholism for five generations. That same family, family's been fighting incest in the family for six generations. Are you listening? 
because they were established in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s. And as they began to build, Satan says on his map of assignment on the boardroom of hell, if you let me use that expression, he'll say, take this, you take this region right here. And that region grows and it expands and they get familiar with the people and the leaders and the politicians and they know who they can manipulate why would they leave a city of one million to go to a town in Alaska of 25,000 you said but yeah we fight stuff you fight the sin nature everybody does Town of 50, town of 25, sin nature. People have a sin nature. They sin. That's what they do when they're sinners. You fight spirits. There are spirits. It's not, to, it's not to tell you that there's not demons. You know there's demons up here. You know there's demonic spirits that come and go, as the Bible says, walking through a dry place and seeking. But here's the thing you got to get. You're so pristine, and God has you here up in this area. Let me tell you something. If you're from where I'm from, you got to want to come to Alaska. It's a long way, baby. Yeah. And then these, these long winters you guys got. You guys, look, I'm going to tell you something. I admire you. I salute you with both my hands because I could not take darkness that long. I would be, ooh, 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 Pam, get me out of here. Get me to Florida. I don't know. How, I really don't know how you, you guys are, I know, you guys are like, We've talked about it. This has got to be some of the toughest, coolest people in the world. But see, here's the thing. Because of the area, because of, watch, the tourism's coming in. You can influence tourism. You can influence the people coming in. You can testify of the Lord to a lot of people. Right? We've had people come to our meetings that were touring Florida, touring Georgia, got saved because they just heard that guy Perry Stone said, let's go hear him. They were tourists. They weren't church members. But you do not have the levels of demons that San Francisco, Los Angeles, Seattle, Chicago, Birmingham has to deal with. You do have to deal with the carnal nature of people. You do have to deal with belligerent people. A lot of you probably, there's drugs and alcohol. That's going to be there. You got that. So is there sin? Yes. And people need to be saved. But the thing is, though, because it's never been touched by the prince of Persia, the prince of Grecia, and these other areas, you have an open door to pray and seek God like no other state in the United States and send people to those places from a place where they have been full of fire and anointing and the word. You send them out of here to those places. And when you said that this morning, man, the Holy Ghost hit me and said, see what he's doing. That's what they're supposed to do. They've got to take the people that have been untouched and unspoiled by this uh, demon of spirits and you learn about him and you know about him and you know how to pray and you've taught prayer and you've taught fasting and they say, now we're ready because we got some weapons. Let me, let, me just, let me just show you. Let me show you my example. Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 A.D., burnt to the ground. When Jerusalem is destroyed and when Jerusalem is burnt to the ground in 70 A.D., 6,000 Jews are slaughtered and all the Jews are taken into captivity. And the Christians, instead of staying in Jerusalem, where the conflict was, the battle was, and where death is coming, they are warned by an angel to go to Pela, and they go to Pela in Jordan, and they build a community, and Herod permits them to do it, and they build the largest Christian community. And when Jerusalem burns and the Jews are captive, all the Christians that listen to God are at Pela and they're working farms and they're plowing and they're winning people and they're praying for the sick and people are getting healed and they spread the gospel up through Syria and all the way down into, into that part of the world. Two, 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 two types of people. One group not under the oppression, not under the level that Jerusalem was under. Jerusalem is under. Are you seeing my parallel? Is anybody receiving this? Are you seeing my parallel? So my parallel is you guys are like the Pela. You can, can I tell you something? You all can build whatever you want to build. Well, listen, but why do you think, why do you think the enemies fought getting this church up? Word got out somewhere. There's, there's, some, there's, there's a dude up there in Alaska that's shaking the place. But you know what? But you know what? Can I tell you something? That ain't bad. That's good. If you're on the devil's radar, that means, whoo, we must be getting ready to do something big. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
So you don't ignore a battle. You don't despise it. You can't do that. I've been through, I've been through, I've been through crazy stuff. I found out that there's some crazy, insane people in the world, okay? I just want you to know that. You wouldn't believe it. We're not, we don't talk about it, but if I told you, if I could give you a back line for one hour, you'd say, oh my, you got to be kidding me. Yeah, 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 no, I'm not kidding. So what I'm saying is, you know the battle's real. You have to deal with the battle, you know. You got to deal with states. You got to deal with legal. But here's the point. You keep your eyes on the finish line. Look, looking unto Jesus, author and finisher. And you keep your eyes on that because you know if we're fighting it that heavy, then that means the heavier glory's coming. And that's what you have to keep. Every warfare that I ever had to fight, just, you know, I'm talking about strange stuff. Everyone I had to fight, God was going to see if I was going to endure through it. And then afterwards, huge, stupid, <laughs> stupid breakthroughs start coming. And I'm like, really, are you kidding me? Did I tell you what happened to me last year with that guy sending me all that stuff in the box from Jerusalem? Did I tell that last year? You want to hear this? I'm almost done. I promise I'm almost done. I'm just about, I think I've shared with you a, ba a foundation to help you to see, yes, battles are coming. And the more you do, there will be battles. But you guys have an opportunity here of doing what I don't know if any other state has the opportunity of doing. And that is building great ministries and building great churches and then sending people into these areas armed with the power of God. You, you're going to sin. That's, that's part of what you're going to do. And I just told Pastor, I walk through. Now, Pastor, if I'm out of order, I apologize. But I've got to feel. I told Pastor, I said, I want to tell you what I, I feel like I can see in this building. There's a kindergarten through fifth grade. you got these offices all through here. You need to start you a school here. A Christian school for kids. A, an actual school, you can do it, and you need to, you need to train them while they're young because I'm telling you the enemy's going after them in kindergarten now. And we have to have options. That woman homeschooled my children for 24 years probably total, but two of them total, 24 years. That's why she didn't get to travel with me a lot. But I'm telling you one thing. I got a girl that's full of the Holy Ghost and fire at the ramp working with Karen Wheat, and I got a son that was on drugs working in the ministry. And I'm going to tell you why they got touched to God because he heard the word every day in that school, every single day, and he could never get away from the seed that was planted on the inside of him. You got to keep on planting the seed to the next generation and the kids. And, the, and God will take care of prayer. Oh, make him that seed grow. Give him a praise in the house. And I'm a kashata. And a kashata. Now, is it all right if I pause the internet? Okay, if y'all are mute, y'all ain't going to hear nothing. See, what you should have done is come to church. See? Thanks for listening to this message today. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need Jesus as your Savior and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them today and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life. And I pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065? We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.